Day 2. Hello Kubernetes with Minikube. In this section of the course, we will cover a lot of ground. We're going to talk about Kubernetes architecture, Kubernetes manifest, kubectl config, Helm for package management, and then finally, we're going to deploy a complex application. Kubernetes architecture. In this section of the video, we're going to do a quick whistle-stop tour of the Kubernetes architecture and some of its more important resource types. As we can see from the diagram on screen, there's a number of components to a Kubernetes cluster. So if we look over on the left hand side, we see the components that are known as the control plane. And then on the right hand side, we see the components in the area known as the workers or the nodes. In this diagram, it's described as Kubernetes minions. But that's kind of like an old name now. So let's focus on the control plane, on the master components. So what do we have? Well, first of all, we have an API server. And that's where the Kubernetes resources are published into. And they're stored in etc.d, which is a key value store, a distributed key value store that's highly available and resilient to failure. Then next, we have the kube scheduler. So the kube scheduler is responsible for scheduling the pods, which we'll talk about in more detail soon. And it's responsible for scheduling those pods onto the worker nodes. It makes decisions based on availability of resources and many other types of criteria. Then we can also see that we have this kube controller manager. And the kube controller manager has a number of control threads that are running and watching on Kubernetes resources published into the API server. And based on seeing those resources, certain actions will be taken. So there's controllers in there for things like a deployment resource, stateful sets, things like that, which we're going to go into more detail as we progress. And then finally, on the control side, we have the cloud controller manager. And that's responsible for talking to a particular cloud that you might have deployed Kubernetes into to do things like deploy elastic load balancers if you're in AWS or EBS volumes, once again, if you're in AWS. So now if we have a look at the workers, then we'll see that there's a couple of components there to deal with. The first one is the kubelet. So the kubelet is responsible for talking to the API server and also to another container daemon, such as Rocket. And then it gets the daemon to start the containers. It does some other tasks as well. And then next up is the kube proxy, which once again talks to the Kubernetes API server. And based on that, does things such as writing IP tables rules on a node so that different pods, the different containers, can find themselves on the network. So now let's have a look at a concept that's going to appear time and time again in Kubernetes resources, and that's labels and selectors. So what we can see here is we've got two resource types. We've got a service and we've got a pod. And we can see that the pod has some labels. Now labels are just key value pairs. And they're used to do things like describe a particular resource. Then if we look at the service, we see that it's got some selectors. And selectors, once again, are key value pairs. But instead of describing the resource, they're used to select it. So in this example here, we can see that a service resource is selecting a set of pods. And that is based on a match between the selectors in the service and the labels, or at least a subset of the labels in the pod. So let's start looking at the Kubernetes resources, or at least a few of the more important ones. So if we look at the diagram on the left, we can see that there's a pod, and it's got three classes of containers within it. It's got initialization containers, sidecar containers, and application containers. So an application container is what you would think of as your fundamental piece of work that you want to execute. It might be like an Nginx server, for instance. An initialization container is a container that's going to execute on initialization on startup of the pod, and it will do some piece of work and then complete and terminate. An example of this might be setting up a database. Then sidecar containers are containers that support the application and continue to run for the lifetime of the pod. An example of this might be a log shipper or maybe a metrics collector. As we can see from the diagram on the right, pods have labels. As we showed previously, a label is a name value pair and it's used to identify a pod or a set of pods. And then some other resource can use it to select the set of pods. So moving on, we come to deployments. 
Now, generally speaking, you wouldn't run a pod on its own. You'd wrap it in some kind of workload, such as a deployment, as we show here. And there's other styles of workload, which we're going to go through over the next few slides. So what a deployment is, basically, is describes a specification for a pod with some additional things like how many replicas you want. And then when you create this deployment or update the deployment, it creates a new replica set. And that replica set is a snapshot of the deployment at the time of creation. And then the replica set is responsible for creating the pods. By having these replica sets, it's possible to roll backwards if you find an issue with your application. Next up is daemon sets. So as the name suggests, they're kind of like a daemon. And the idea with that is that when you schedule a daemon set, a pod will land on each of the nodes in the cluster, by default anyway. You can further refine which nodes that the pod will land on. Thinking behind a daemon set is that you might want to run standard services such as log shippers and metrics collectors on each of the nodes within a cluster. Next, we have stateful sets. A stateful set is a way of managing pods and giving them a guaranteed name with a specific storage volume to be attached to them. It also guarantees the order in which the pods are started and stopped. Certain distributed databases and other types of workload need these kind of guarantees, with Elasticsearch being a good example. We're going to talk more about stateful sets later on in the course. Then we have jobs. Jobs will run one or more pods to completion. And you might want to use this to, say, populate a database, do a backup job, or some other batch process. And a cron job will run a job on a schedule using the standard cron format for the schedule time. Now we move on to our next category of resource types. That's discovery and load balancing. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the service. We touched on the service earlier when we were talking about labels and selectors. So what a service is, is it provides DNS name within the cluster and a cluster IP so that routing can happen between workloads within the cluster. And it's also used by the kubeproxy system component we described earlier in the architecture diagram. And the kubeproxy system component uses the service definition to write IP tables rules so that that routing can occur. So services are great for communication within the cluster. But how do you actually make a service within the cluster available externally? Well, that's where the ingress resource comes in. So an ingress resource configures up HTTP rules for services so that they're accessible outside the cluster using what's called an ingress controller. We're going to go into a lot more detail about that later. And our next category is config and storage, with the first resource being a config map. So rather than putting your application configuration inside a container and building separate containers for each environment, say, what you can do is you can externalize the configuration into a config map. So we can see here in this diagram that we have a file called app.yaml, probably for Spring Boot, and it has some configuration in there. And then that's mounted into the pod at runtime. And then we have a secret. Like a config map, a secret can have files within it, as in this example, a private key. It's really just key value pairs. So it could also have a password. And the difference between a config map and a secret, a config map is mounted in into the file system in a pod. A secret can be mounted into the file system on a pod, but equally the key value pairs can be mounted in as environment variables into the pod. So your password could be mounted in as an environment variable and consumed by your application. Then we have persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. Persistent volumes represent some distributed storage that can be consumed by a pod to maintain state. And a persistent volume claim is a way for a pod to claim that storage. We're going to go into a lot more detail about this as we progress through the course. And then finally is namespaces. And this is where it all comes together. As described before, namespaces can be thought of kind of like environments. In this example, we have production, staging, and development. And namespaces have resources published into them in a grouping that makes sense. So in this example, we can see that we have an ingress resource, which is going to route traffic from the internet, for instance, into a service, which will then route traffic through to a set of pods. And those pods have persistent state mounted in using a persistent volume claim. Okay, so let's go back into the dashboard and have a look at some of those resource types that we just described.
So as we look on the left hand navigation pane, we'll see some categories such as the workloads, discovery and load balancing, config and storage. And then under the workloads, we can see things we were describing such as the pods, daemon sets, deployments, replica sets. On the discovery and load balancing, we can see ingresses and services. And on the config and storage, we can see the config maps, persistent volume claims and secrets. So in the next video, we're going to talk about Kubernetes manifests.